A fine, nasty rain was drizzling at the Philadelphia airport. You would never have guessed that it was the middle of summer if you hadn't felt the sticky, stifling heat along with the humidity. You couldn't see the sun behind the gray shroud. I had been in this same airport just five hours earlier, on my way to Atlanta. When I got there, it turned out that the three-day conference in Atlanta had been abruptly canceled, so I just turned around and headed back on the next flight. I probably still should have called home before my flight, but there didn't seem to be a pressing need. The local airline plane I'd taken to Atlanta was now on a return flight to Reading, so there were only two of us in the passenger cabin. Hey there. Since we're alone here, do you mind if I sit next to you? The stranger, the second passenger, asked me. No problem. Make yourself comfortable. He was a good-looking guy, a little younger than me, well-groomed and stylishly dressed. Do you use this flight a lot? I asked him, just to break the ice. Usually about once a month, and more often if I'm lucky, he answered eagerly. How lucky is it to be in Reading? I wondered. I wondered. I'm going to visit my girlfriend there, he grinned meaningfully. Oh, well, then I guess you'll be lucky. There was a brief lull as the plane left the ground and began to gain altitude. Does she live in Reading itself? I resumed our conversation as soon as the atmospheric pressure was out of my ears. Yes, but we usually meet and stay at the Sheraton Inn, replied my vis-a-vis. -vis. Why? Well, she's married, so we have to be a little careful. Why today? It's only the middle of the week. Here he grinned again and tapped the tip of his nose with his index finger. It's all covered, chief. Every time her husband goes out of town on business, she calls me and I fly right over. He's some kind of, like, engineer or something, and he travels a lot on company business. He won't be home this week until Friday. I don't suppose she has any children? I asked him. You guessed wrong. She actually has two. Her oldest daughter, who is going to college next month, is off at the coast with friends, and her son is at summer camp. The conversation suddenly took a very interesting turn. I reached into my shirt pocket and discreetly turned on my miniature tape recorder. You guys are really good at this. I showed that I was really interested in his story, while encouraging this Cossack to keep going. We're good at it because we've been doing it for three years now, the neighbor in the chair said smugly. You're full of shit, I told him. It's been three years and her husband still hasn't found out? I think it's because he spends too much time on his work or hobby. What is it about a hobby that takes up so much time? I threw another hook. The other passenger perked up. You know, he buys and sells coins on eBay. I guess he makes a good living at it, at least from what Caroline had told me. That was the first time he mentioned his girlfriend's name. Pardon my curiosity, but I'm really curious. How did this whole thing get started? How did a guy from Philly meet a married woman from Reading? Oh, it was a whole story. He flashed a thousand-dollar white-toothed smile. I went there about three years ago for a conference. Actually, I'm in pharmaceutical sales, and the headquarters of the pharmacist's convention was at the King of Prussia Hotel at the time. At that hotel, I ran into a former member of our fraternity who lived there, Keith Fuhrman. He had been sleeping with Caroline for over five years by then. By the way, the boy I mentioned, you know, the one who's at summer camp now, she got him from Keith, and the hubby still has no idea. He chuckled leaning back, slapping his hands on the armrests of his chair and shaking his head. He anyway, Keith was getting ready to move to Chicago at the time, he continued, calming down a bit. Look, my first impression was, uh, what a gorgeous woman. He smacked his lips. Oh yeah, man, it was so sweet. Caroline is the most luscious woman I've ever met, he said dreamily, stretching his lips into a wide grin. The next morning, they asked me if I could replace Keith after he left. Heck, I jumped at the chance, and we've been great ever since. What about your wife? I asked him. My wife? Buddy, I love her very much, and I'll make sure she never finds out about anything. I wouldn't do anything to hurt her. You think your sex with another woman doesn't hurt her? No, of course not, not if she doesn't find out. What about Caroline's husband? According to her, he's impenetrably stupid and clueless. Hey, I remember her laughing about naming Keith's son Bob Jr. just so her husband would think he was hers. He laughed again. 
I turned to the window and looked out at the land below. It looked like we were preparing to land in Redding. Why doesn't Caroline just divorce that asshole? There's a little trick to it, he winked and snapped his fingers. Her hubby has two more years until he's eligible for the company pension plan. She wants to wait until then to get her hands on his half of the pension. Besides, she's now figuring out a way to get her husband to pay for Bob Jr.'s college tuition later. Caroline seems to have it all figured out, and one day poor hubby is going to get it right between the eyes. Or rather, right between his branching horns, he cackled. I sure as hell wouldn't want to be in his shoes, I hissed. How are you going to get to the Sheraton? I usually take a cab. Look, I have a car here, right in the airport parking lot. I'd love to give you a ride. I offered him. I handed him a computer repairman's business card I happened to have in my pocket, and he gave me one of his own. Really? That would be great, rejoiced my traveling companion. It didn't rain in Reading, thankfully, and we made it to the Sheraton Hotel in about 20 minutes. I dropped him off at the entrance and watched him go inside. My wife Caroline met him at the door and took him under her arm as they walked to the elevator. Now I knew everything I wanted to know. I turned off the recorder and drove home. I spent the next two days taking care of urgent matters so that Caroline wouldn't know I was back. First, in her absence, I paid a visit to our home and gathered all sorts of papers and documents I might need. The coins I packed and loaded into the car were worth about $400,000 retail or about $280,000 wholesale. I only took the clothes and things I needed. I took care to leave no indication that I had ever been in the house. I made four copies of the audio recording. Using the computer, I canceled all joint credit cards and then reformatted the hard drive twice. All eBay information was contained only on my personal laptop. Cell phones I left alone as my daughter Sarah needed them. The next morning, I left my motel and headed to the bank. First, I emptied all of our accounts and then went to the mortgage lending department where I signed an emergency redemption application. They stated that my wife had to sign it too, to which I told them they could get her signature after the default. We owed more money on the house than we could have gotten when we sold it. I then cashed in three certificates of deposit and got fined for it. I cashed in my IRA one and got fined for it again. I didn't care. My insurance broker gave me two checks for the cash value of all my life insurance policies. In total, I received over 40,000 bucks in cash. The bosses at my job didn't want to let me go. We talked, and I got cash compensation for three months of unused vacation, as well as two months of sick leave. They gave me a sizable check for my share of the company's profits, and a generous severance package at the same time since I had categorically waived all rights to a pension plan and health benefits. Finished with work, I drove to Kutztown and prepaid for Sarah's four-year tuition. I put a thousand dollars in an envelope for her, along with a short note, and left it at my mother's house. I got along very well with Sarah and wanted to keep it that way. I left a lot of things unfinished, and I was sure I would be accused of slander and irresponsibility. But I just didn't give a shit. I wasn't going to stay in Reading any longer than necessary. Finally, I handed my lawyer a copy of the audio recording and a mouth swab sample for DNA testing. After filling out the necessary paperwork, I handed him a wad of cash and promised to add more if he ever needed it. He would have to grace Caroline with the divorce papers in about a week. Epilogue. Guadalajara is beautiful, at this time of the season, and probably almost year-round. I have a high-speed internet connection here, and my coin sales on eBay are going just fine. At this point, I have just enough money to get by until my social security payments start. Right now, I specialize in antique silver Mexican coins that fall into my hands from time to time. I respect my clients and always offer them a fair price, and they in return bring me beautiful items with history to sell. What to say about Caroline? Well, she screamed and complained for over a year about me leaving her house and all, and then my ex-girlfriend just gave up. Maybe she just got fed up, or maybe she found another asshole. Honestly, I don't care. It was easy for me to hide out here in the South, and I'm happy with my life. I take language classes three times a week, and I have a hard-working housekeeper with luscious forms who also shares my bed with me. I talk to Sarah every week, but Caroline doesn't need to know about that. 
life goes on.